Okay, let's go. And people are just starting to notice the art form of tattooing and seeing what can actually be done, and it's it's way different than what they maybe have had in their in their mind before. You know, when they thought about a tattoo, they thought like, oh, I can only get this or that, or now they can fucking get anything. I mean, there's you know people all over the world doing every single kind of tattooing. If somebody had told me when I first started that tattooing was going to be at this level, that the kind of things that are being done were going to be done that I had never seen then, I wouldn't even have believed it. You know, when I first started tattooing, I'd be sitting on the doorstep of the shop smoking a cigarette. I'd see somebody walking down the street, and I'd be like, oh, they're coming to get a tattoo. So I gotta put my cigarette out, go back inside. Whereas now you can sit on the doorstep, and it's like any one of those people could be walking in the shop. Like I grew up in Massachusetts where tattooing was illegal, you know, the whole time I lived there. When I told my parents that's what I wanted to do, it was like saying I wanted to be a burglar, you know, it wasn't a, wasn't a cool thing. Oh, this is gonna be crazy. Tattoos are more visible today than ever. They're impossible to ignore. The stigmata of bad boys for centuries, tattooing has undergone a revolution, and its recent huge popularity has made it part of everyday life. It's now seen as an art form in its own right, with its own schools, followers, copycats, and geniuses. To understand how, in 50 years, tattooing has moved from the back street to the mainstream, we decided to ask those who have shaped its history and contributed to this transformation. But before hearing from them, a little history. Tattooing is as old as the hills. The Inuits in the Arctic, the Maoris in Polynesia, the Picts in Britain. All peoples have practiced it, either as a form of ID, a rite of passage, a therapeutic cure, or a religious symbol. Tattoos have had as many uses as they have forms. But in the West, in the 8th century, body markings based on pagan beliefs were banned by the clergy in a papal bull issued by Pope Adrian I. Man had no right to change the body given to him by God. It wasn't until the 17th century, the time of the great explorations, that sailors came into contact with the peoples of the Pacific. Captain Cook's crew disembarked in England, covered in blue ink. The sailors had episodes that had marked their life tattooed onto their skin. The tradition was born, and tattooing became synonymous with adventure and exoticism. Some aristocrats in the courts of Europe, fascinated by the practice, adopted it in the 19th century. In the back alleys between taverns and brothels, the first tattoo shops opened in the port towns of Britain, where sailors added tattooing to drinking and brawling as an off-duty activity. It seems only natural that it migrated from the ports to the prisons. In Latin countries, like France and Italy, Tattoos became a must for jailbirds. Seamen, prisoners, marginals. In the 19th century, the symbol of adventurers had become that of the bad boys. It was in 1960s California that the first tattooing revolution took place. Notably in San Francisco, the port city turned hotbed of underground culture where hippies, rockers, and much of the avant-garde art movement rubbed shoulders. Amid this atmosphere of protest, a handful of artists of the needle, such as Lyle Tuttle, began the process of democratizing tattoos. Didn't have to get any mail today. Okay, here's my... My albatross. There was one. Um, um, where in the hell are these special? Ooh, here we are. We have the granddaddy of them all, which is an Edison autographic printer. Samuel F. O'Reilly 
In 1893, Pat, a crooked tube here, and it had a long arm and a short arm, and that extended the stroke of the machine till it would be long enough to penetrate the skin. So, these are traveling books. In fact, the guy's even first class tattoo designs. And up until probably a little bit before World War I, most tattoo artists were itinerant. They were sailors. They would tattoo aboard ship. When they come ashore, they would tattoo on shore. They would tattoo in the back of pool halls, maybe the back of the bar or something, someplace. And so they didn't have flash that hung on the walls. They carried these books. See, that, that's, that's stylish. And it's on an arm or something. It's isolated. It's all by itself. You can see what it is. 1932. I started tattooing professionally in 1949, and it was predominantly servicemen that got tattooed. It's sort of like a connected with the warrior class, and it's a way of bonding with your buddies and showing allegiance to your military unit and, and things like that. So we worked off of flash, and flash is like sales aids. There are tattoo designs that you put on that you've drawn out on a piece of cardboard and you're, you walked into a tattoo shop and the walls were all bespeckled with these little designs. And the guy would say, I want that one. So it was, it was almost like being an armor or something, you know, like making suits of armor for military men or something. Simple, symbolic designs displayed like badges. The traditional rose with the girlfriend's name, anchors, swallows, regimental insignia, the dragon brought back from the Far East as a travel souvenir. Western tattoo iconography was born at sea. Then in the late 1960s, women's liberation came by. And that was the, that was the rocket that fired tattooing into the popularity that we know of it today. You know, this is the age of Aquarius. I mean, things are starting to loose up. And, you know, the hippies are now coming to the Haight-Ashbury. And plus, I was in everybody's favorite city, San Francisco. Back in those days, I was in more panties than gynecologists because of all the women coming in and getting tattooed. It made it a kinder, gentler art form. and the women started getting tattooed, they're a little bit more concerned about themselves and everything else, so they started demanding more custom design. I ask this of all my lady guests, but do you have any tattoos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a couple. I couldn't help noticing that. Is that something This is new? one. This is one, yeah. It's actually, if I may say so, quite lovely. There's a great cat in San Francisco that does these named Lyle Tuttle, who's mm -hmm got him all over his body. He's just gorgeous, just gorgeous. He has a big sunset here and stars showering down one arm. And, yeah. and, and he has Aztec symbols on his knees. It's too much, me. And on a clear I'm, day, you can see Alcatraz. I invited him, <laughs> I invited him to a party and he tattooed 18 people. <laughs> really? It's a great party. Uh, were they, uh, were they getting... She loved bracelets. And so that's what I wound up doing, was just this little. Then she had a heart put on her chest and the heart was for her close friends. And the bracelet was for everybody. So you have the shows and the non-shows. You don't know the true person until you get all their clothes off. Mr. Tattoo! Tattoos had started to draw interest but by the late 60s, it was still something of a curiosity. Lyle Tuttle showed himself off like the tattooed man in the circuses and fairgrounds of old. My tattooing is, is really traditional Western. It's uh, got a neck band. And it's sort of a hodgepodge of design. I went ahead and got a, like the traditional eagle on my chest and um, went ahead in American style, European style tattooing is where they cover the entire back with uh, one design, generally. Uh, then I became interested in uh, Polynesian-type designs. 
In 1970s is when I started getting rained with all this publicity. What happened to me is just, I mean, it was phenomenal. I was tattooing a young lady one night and I was putting a ring in here. She said, I'm a writer for Rolling Stone magazine. So I wound up on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, who would have believed that? A roommate of hers was a writer for Life magazine. So where did high school dropout, me, Ukiah, California, wind up? Four pages in Life magazine. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. It, and so each article sort of led into another. And the public started to become enlightened about tattooing. And as tattooing became more and more popular, a better grade of artist was brought into the industry. And I hate the word industry, but brought into the trade. I mean, I tattooed for 45 years, and people say, why did you retire so young? Well, there's such good artists nowadays that I got out of tattooing while I had some reputation left. Well, of course, there's Lyle Tuttle, who's like, I think he's 81 years old now. He's always been, you know, one of the champions of, of you know, uh, PR work for uh, public relations, you know, for, for helping to popularize tattooing in general. And then there were guys like, you know, Don Ed Hardy, who also uh, really helped popularize tattoos uh, for a much wider audience than what was getting them before. I enjoyed the, the power of the stuff as American folk art, but at the same time, I, I realized these guys couldn't grow their way out of the paper bag. I said, well, I'll get the gear and, and start out, because there's people at art school already that said they want tattoos. A graduate of the San Francisco Art Institute, Ed Hardy embodied the new profile of artist tattooist. He was mainly responsible for opening up Western tattooing to other cultures, notably the traditional Japanese style, one of the richest and most refined. Rather than get a whole hodgepodge of things, you know, add on a little bit of something every payday, you could sort of wait and, and do something more, more planned out and, and create a better effect. Because the ones that do want to be tattooed should have that option, and they should have a greater sort of visual option than just going in and picking out, you know, A12, the panther that was designed in 1932. You know, it might still be a great image for some people, but you shouldn't have to fit your sensibilities into, into a set of visual aesthetics that are out of sync with, with your life. So um, that's what the Japanese work afforded. Hardy turned towards Irizumi, Japanese-style tattoos. Contrary to its Western counterpart, it was the heir of a genuinely artistic trend. Japanese tattooing, known for its dragons, carp, flowers, and samurais, is very sophisticated and inspired by the woodblock prints of a Chinese illustrated novel translated into Japanese, The Water Margin, or Suikoden, whose heroes, a band of good-hearted outlaws, were all covered in tattoos. The first Japanese master tattooists of the genre launched the fashion for all-over tattooing, which became all the rave with the working people of the city of Edo, now Tokyo. Irizumi became the trademark of the working classes and the best way to affirm one's difference. But the Bakuto, itinerant gamblers and forerunners of the Yakuza, took over the practice, and like in the West, tattoos became forever linked to the lowlife. It still looked down on in Japan, but it would radiate beyond its frontiers. Western tattooing was completely transformed by this encounter with Japanese iconography, its subtle use of colors, and the attention to harmony between body and drawings. Ed Hardy's our grandfather of all a lot of the style I liked, you know, was Californian Japanese. He had a unique clientele, even a lot of professional people that would have maybe n not otherwise got tattooed, you know, but because he had a, a private studio and he offered a very unique style of tattooing, you know, that opened up a whole new level of, of tattooing. Tattooing had thus become avant-garde, an authentic artistic school. Tattooists congregated, swapped ideas, inspired each other, and formed clans. A trip to California for 1970s tattooists became as important as the traditional sojourn in Italy for the painters of the 17th century. Philippe Bleu, the son of a tattooist, was one of the great new adventurers. 
seeing Hardy's work in the person and watching him work and meeting everybody else in the Bay Area. You know, the first shop I went to visit was Lyle Tuttle's. I mean, when my father sent me with my sister, I was 17, she was 16. So we went uh, stopping in Bombay, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Tokyo, San Francisco, visiting tattooers in every country. And it's when I got to Japan that I'd seen Japanese work before in photos, but when you sit in a room with three or four people that are full and it's so neat and so unified and so much like clothing, what we would learn was all this European, small, fine, you know, little. And I sat next to some guy in Hori Kin's shop in Yokohama, and I was looking at his arm, and it was big pieces of red and gray and, and a big line and a small line. And when you looked at it closely, you couldn't see what it was, really. But when you went back, it became, you know, the dragon or whatever. It was like, yeah, it inspired me a lot. <laughs> It wasn't only the Japanese style that influenced Western tattooists. Some of them look back to primitive art and tribal practices. As you can see on the work that I have on my arms that are basically a takeoff of that. They're my designs, but uh, very much inspired by Borneo style of tattooing and Polynesian as well. This work's been done on me by Ed Hardy. And uh, the bolder tattooing, I feel uh, it's better as far as wearability of tattooing. It lasts a lot longer. The peoples of the Pacific Islands also had an ancient tradition of tattooing. Abstract swaths of black ink and Borneo would next inspire tattooists. They adopted them, combined them, and reinterpreted them, giving rise to the so-called tribal style. Within Ed Hardy's avant-garde movement, tattooists experimented with every kind of graphic style on an underground clientele. As Japan and the Pacific invaded the West Coast, local tattooing continued to progress. Prison tattooists like Charlie Cartwright, Jack Rudy, and Freddie Negretti professionalized their art and began working on working class customers. With attention to realistic detail and shading, they turned their East LA store, Tattoo Land, into a new school in its own right. I just like the look of black and various shades of gray and flesh, uh, even though everything is, is colored in real life, it's just like when you watch a, a black and white movie or see a black and white photograph, there's some, there's a certain quality about that that it just isn't in a colored photograph. And I really like that look because with the way my arms are, if they were, if they were all in color, I suppose it it would look like I was wearing a shirt all the time when I'm not wearing one. Well, that was a, um, a style that was very popular in some of the California prisons. And uh, since we were working in East LA, you know, our clientele was, you know, probably 90% Chicano. And a lot of these guys that came to us, our original customers, had done time in the joint or had homeboys that had done time in the joint. You know, and, and a lot of people, you know, they got their neighborhoods tattooed on their stomach or their neck or uh, their girlfriend's names or their baby's names. Yeah. And, and the, of course, the imagery of the beautiful Chicana girls, you know, the cholas. This type of tattooing called black and gray was the style used in prisons worldwide. The face of a loved one, a gang name, mottos and sayings. The iconography of the style was primarily about lettering and portraits. Tattooists continued striving to make tattooing part of everyday life, yet it was rebellious symbolism that actually made it popular. Tattoos also became part of the biker's uniform. Beyond leather jackets, boots and bikes, their tattoos symbolized their rejection of society and their hostility. In the mid-70s, bikers became a new showcase for tattoos. Come over here, take your shirt off. It's all free here. It's all free. Here's some stuff I did right here. This is all free here tattooing. Come on. Oh, no. Look at all the original free hand stuff. Have you done many today? I've been working every night for the last three nights, 10 in the morning until 4 o'clock at night. This is fucking Laconia, man. Laconia, Laconia, man. 
Mark Mahoney, one of the main figures of American tattooing, runs one of the trendiest joints in Los Angeles, the Shamrock Social Club, his studio. Before becoming the tattooist of stars, Mark Mahoney began his career in the 1970s on the arms of bikers in Massachusetts, where tattoos were banned. When I started in Massachusetts, it was 90% more bikers, you know, and almost 100% of the time I would work at a motorcycle club clubhouse. And, you know, that was really fun, you know, and that was kind of the heyday of the, you know, outlaw bikers in the late 70s. It was all the Vietnam veteran guys coming back and, you know, having a good time. And they were real, that was a real brotherhood. That was a cool thing to be around. And, you know, and then it changed when I went to New York and it was, you know, like musicians and photographers and it was more artists, you know. And I think in particularly when it was musicians and celebrities, somehow it made it more acceptable to the average person when they saw it wasn't just bikers, it wasn't just ex-convicts, it wasn't just, you know. Oh, and you gotta have that one with that beautiful Mark Mahoney artwork right there on the cover. All right, you gotta get the ACDC action. People seen that Bon Scott rocking his tattoo, and that was uh, inspirational. Like the Rose tattoo guys from Australia being the head of that pack. A word that sums up these seditious artists who use tattoos to extend their rebellious art into their skin. These Australian hard rockers embodied the tattooed anti-conformist figure, giving an unprecedented exhibition of the art form which the forthcoming punk movement would adopt as the ultimate protest accessory. Mark Mahoney tattooed several of the icons of punk, Notably, Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols and Johnny Thunders, singer of the New York Dolls. You know, like Johnny Thunders is one of the people that, that uh, planted the seed for going to the West Coast for me. He'd tell me about, he'd show me the tattoos he got. One of his road managers came in with some tattoos from Bob Roberts and seeing the stuff was real nice and nothing on the East Coast seemed to compare at the time. So I had it, you know, that's where I had to go. I'd say in the last three or four years, uh, the punk rockers, which have uh, very diverse art forms, have been starting to get quite a lot of tattoos. And, you know, the stuff they get is, is uh, you know, ranges from anything from skulls to, you know, pretty heavy type of imagery. I mean, back a few years ago, really the only American type of tattooing was like you could say an eagle or an anchor or something like that. But now, American tribal tattooing has really come into its own identity because of this art form, this punk rock art form. People that are getting this type of work are realizing that it's not so much how much detail and how many lines and how many colors you can pack into something, but it's what you're saying with a piece. From then on, closely followed by the skinhead movement, punks dove headfirst into ink and made tattooing their own. Gone with the dragons and traditional symbols, their tattoos spoke of their music and lifestyle. Like Henry Rollins, lead singer of Black Flag, whose personalized tattoos, band logo, the movement slogan, became his stage wear. Why, yo, what are them, you say? Yo, my friend, but you're what are them? Henry Rollins came into the tattoo shop after he played a show at the Dancing Waters. And he says he wants me to do a back piece on him. And he described the back like a ton of work, you know. And uh, I told him, OK, you know, that'll be about whatever, $2,000 at the time. And he was shocked. I mean, what do you mean? He's like, oh, 
I thought you would do it for nothing. Like, get the fuck out of here. I wouldn't tattoo my mother for nothing. This is what I do for a living. I don't ask you to come over my house fucking, you know, have a concert or whatever. This is what I do. We got coffee and split. So I never got to work on him, man. But he was good for tattooing, man. Destroy! Right now! Punk rock kids were getting had more tattooed than the West Coast for a long time because places like New York City tattooing was illegal. And guys like the Crow Mags and Murphy's Law, they kind of jumped the gun and were getting tattooed underground in New York. Yeah? And they ended up kind of starting a movement on the East Coast of people getting a ton of stuff, you know? Rockers and punks had invented a new function for tattooing that went beyond musical trends. It enabled people to display their place in society, to affirm opinions, and to show they belonged to a culture, a tribe, and a certain lifestyle. Without tattoos, there is no, uh, <clears throat> there is no life. It expresses an individual's way to look, you know? In New York City, to get noticed is almost impossible. We're working on it. I think they were the first, like, guys with sleeves on MTV, you know? They had one little brief moment when that stuff was socially acceptable enough to sneak onto MTV, but um, it was shocking at the time for people to see these guys, motorcycles and, you know, f fully tattooed up like that, man. In the early 90s, rockers were no longer performing in underground venues, but in stadia. Tattoos were seen by millions of fans, and a clear sign of their consecration, the tattooists of stars became stars in their own right. I've been dragged out on stage in front of 10,000 people. Tattooing a lot of bands in, in my career, like Slayer, Pantera, Lamb of God, Sepultura. So I spent my summers just touring with, with musicians, and tattooing them in their dressing rooms. You know, they always want work that is able to be seen from stage. Something that really grabs people from a distance. And the fans started getting tattooed, and uh, it escalated from there. It was a funny thing for me to go from tattooing, you know, punk rock guys and bikers, and, and then all of a sudden, I was tattooing these hip hop guys. Pac and, you know, the notorious B.I.G. and Suge Knight and Puffy and Red Man, Method Man, all of these guys. And I never thought I'd be tattooing you know, guys like this, and it was pretty cool. I had a, uh, I guess my timing has been, I've been lucky to be around when, you know, things were happening. And... Showbiz followed in the wake of music and fell in love with tattooing. The steamiest stars were keen to show off their new tattoos. While their more sensible colleagues copied them so they too could have the rebel stamp that attracted the paparazzi. It brought it into the spotlight and led lots of new people to get tattooed, and in huge numbers. I'd say the downside is that people want the same work the celebrities have. You know, they want... Uh, Pamela Anderson had the barbed wire around her arm. Oh, man, everyone started getting barbed wire around their arm. And that was the big thing. During the 90s, the rebel look was even up on the podiums. Look at Gautier, he didn't he send all the tattooed girls down the ramps and made it very fashionable tattooing Gautier, you know? You sit in the doctor's office and you turn in the page and there's some perfume ad with a girl with a tattoo design on there, you know? Parisian tattooist Tintin, lauded across the globe, was one of the main artists responsible for popularizing tattoos in Europe. He was naturally one of the first to be approached by designer labels. Ah, it's not bad at all. 
Tattooing has become cool. It's what we worked hard for, so we can't complain. Trouble is, today a lot of people are biting the hand that feeds them and saying, yeah, but that's not real tattooing, etc., etc. But what is tattooing? It's what we do. If you make it popular and then brands come along and want to use it to sell their products, then that's great. That's what we wanted. So we shouldn't complain about it. Won over by the general trend for tattooing, brands decided to use the tattoo look like a miracle recipe. Scott Campbell, darling of the trendy set, is, apart from being a tattooist, an artist whose works exhibited in galleries are inspired by tattoo iconography. He was approached by designer Marc Jacobs, one of his clients, to work with a French luxury baggage house. Tattoos were now omnipresent. Tattoo shops sprang up everywhere, and tattooing was even the subject of a reality TV show. I'm opening up my own tattoo shop. Meanwhile, I'm making house calls, giving actor Eric Balfour a tattoo that pays respect to his hometown. It's so incredibly beautiful, man. I'm Kat Von D, and this is LA Inc. Becoming picked up by the visual side of our world, and more people see they do. <laughs> you know, you, the more you see it, like in fashion and, and art and on television, um, all of a sudden it becomes, it becomes less intimidating to people. social security number, so they'll always know who I am. It's a souvenir of me living in Paris, and it's something I've always wanted. <laughs> I don't think so. I think this is my one. Et voilà. It'll move with me. Exactly. Okay, a spot of cream before I dress it. This is my second tattoo, but it's my first real one. I didn't really think about the first one. I was at a tattoo convention. Someone asked me to try it out, and I just cracked. It wasn't thought out at all. A lot of people told me that once you get your first tattoo, you can't stop. I didn't believe them. It took me five years to get another one, and I guess I'm now an addict. Let's do it. OK. Is your hairdresser dead? <laughs> I'm such a jerk. A bald guy poking fun at other people's hair. <laughs> Accessible to all and freed from its bad boy aura, tattooing is invading all kinds of skin. With popular and media attention, its status has changed. From protest statement, it has become a fashion statement. As such, it's been adopted by the masses. Everyone wants one, and everyone wants theirs to be seen. What people used to do before to test the water and see if they like tattooing has now become this. I'll do this and see how it goes. Right? <laughs> Can you make sure that it comes a little bit out of my <laughs> collar? A little bit up on my collar, that, you know, because that you see it a little bit. That's what the, you get a lot of that, you know? Tattoos are now all the rage, like never before. Over 20% of the American population is tattooed. And Europe isn't far behind. Young adults are succumbing to the needle. More than one French person in 10 now has a tattoo. Now it's at the point where if you live in a you know major city like LA and you don't have a tattoo and you're under 40, you're kind of a rebel, you know. It's it's crazy to say that, that the tables have been turned like that, you know. Through the mechanisms of our mercantile society, tattooing is more popular than ever. But this popularity is only one aspect of the phenomenon. In 30 years, a genuine culture of Western tattooing has emerged and won credibility. 
Like painting and music, tattooing is now considered a fine art with its periods, authors, and styles. So now, like when everybody has tattoos, a lot more focus is placed on what do you have tattooed? Because just having it is no big deal. Every bank teller in New York has a tattoo. You know, people have the, the choice, you know, to, to pick what kind of tattoo they want. And the fact that there's so many tattoo artists out there now that are all doing different, different styles and different uh, forms of tattooing, it's making it a lot easier for everybody to get a tattoo and to get the right tattoo, not just something that somebody else has. You know, everybody's becoming more and more uh, unique, you know, on, on what they're getting. So tattooing has prog progressed or digressed into something entirely different today. It's decorative, but it's still internal feelings that you wear on your exterior. Norm, a renowned graffiti artist on the West Coast, has become one of the most sought after tattooists for his lettering. Uh, it's, uh, they're Buddhist terms. Um, this one's karuna, it means compassion. And then the side is gonna be a uh, upeka, it means uh, equanimity. There's four Brahma Viharas and, um, to practice. I already have two of them on the sides of my hands. I'm gonna do the other two on my. You know, nowadays the lettering is so, you know, it's become so important that um, it can just be the only thing about the tattoo. That's it. I end up doing a lot of wives' names and kids' names and, and, and all that stuff is, is great because it's something that people are very, very, very happy, you know, to get done. This is pretty new. Both of my daughters. Lettering has become extremely incredible. Popularity, you know. People are getting sentences, paragraphs, poems. You know, words are there to, to describe things and or names. And so every little bit that goes along with that, I think, is the reason why they're doing it. It's for the demons right here. My KBS click, D Money, Eric, Mark, Evan, Nick, and Nico, and Sean. BX, Uptown. One of the renaissance of tattooing is people returning to their cultures. So that's why tattooing is experiencing a renaissance all over the world. Yeah, these that represent the, um, my culture, you know what I mean? It's got, you know, a charro, the Mexican Revolution, Guatemo, Aztec General, Warrior. I got Malencia, Marizuma the third, Tino Chiclan, Santa Maria was, you know, Don Cortez. Well, these are prison tattoos. Artists like Jack Rudy and Baby Ray, they brought it from the prisons to the streets. You know, now it's the homies made, everybody loves it now. The prison style black and gray has, by a strange irony of fate, become one of the most popular styles of our day. They're realistic, unequivocal tattoos, identical reproductions of the images in the world of the person who wears them. Jose Lopez, founder of the Lowrider Tattoo Studios, is today considered a master of the genre. You know, we do a lot of collaging, you know, like you just get different images and one image turns into another one and it's, it's like telling a story, you know? You know, one thing that's very popular right now, it's uh, portraits, like portraiture, you know? Everybody's getting portraits, and uh, some of these people that are getting that, they don't even, they weren't even into tattooing before, you know? But now they have a reason to get a tattoo. So they come and they get a portrait. They have a lot of kids, so they get a lot of portraits all over the place, you know? Like now, you go to Europe, you go to, you go to Japan, you know, you here, I'm here especially, you know, you see it all over the place. It's the West Coast right here. Yeah. In this day and age that stuff changes so fast and things come and go, that I think a lot of young people look to things from the past as something 
that has, that is sturdy, that, you know, like the Rock of Ages, that stone cross in the middle of the ocean, that's, that's something that you can hang on to, and that's what it was designed for, and I think that's what draws people to a lot of classic style tattooing in general, like that. When is about tattoos, I really like this, the old school rough man tattoo, you know, like when you see these old pictures of sailors and, it's kind of like the traveler, the underdog. Certain tattooists like Duke Riley are looking back to the past and the roots of the original tattoos. He reworks the symbols and iconography of sailors by adding a touch of his own. When I was younger, I worked with my uncle uh, down on the, on the fish pier, and there were all these guys that had these tattoos that were all kind of blown out and crazy looking, and I, I just remember thinking that I really wanted to, you know, have tattoos like that. The first one I did with Duke was this one, the sheep wheel. The second one was this one, is the mermaid. And the third one was last week, was this one. You can see it's still a little bit fresh. Now today is my fourth from him. When you're putting tattoos, you're almost beating a second, a second yourself. You start, you're changing your body forever, so I think it's all about the character they want to, to create, kind of. The client is is really an artist too. And in many cases, they're more of an artist than the, than the person that's executing the tattoo because they're the one putting themselves on display and altering their body in a certain way and making all of these long thought out decisions uh, conceptually and then bringing them to the, the, you know, the artist to execute. It's hard to be really adventurous in tattooing because at the end of the day, it's going on someone else who has to agree with it, you know, so it's, it's not like painting or drawing where you can just kind of be like, ah, oh, this might be fun to do, and then just, you know, tattoo it, and you'd be like, ah, oh, no, that didn't come out so great. No, it's, it's just like whatever people... To informed amateurs, the craftsmanship in the work is crucial, and the choice of tattooist as important as the motif they chose for their tattoos. I normally do scarier pieces, but uh, this I'm having fun with the textures in the fur. And it's pretty common that people just give me a theme and then I'll draw my vision of it on them and just go for it. <laughs> about 50 hours by Philip Lou. Um, I've been there for, I think, I think five sessions total. So when it was time to balance myself out and tattoo the other arm, I couldn't just put anybody on the other side. And him and Philip, Paul and Philip are so close and they, they balance each other. You know, Paul's a little more dark and Philip is very light, but together they're like brothers. <laughs> so as a collector, Paul really was really in my mind the only person that should be on the other side. But he still made me wait, you know, <laughs> two, three years. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it worked out. It always seems to work out the way it's supposed to. Well, you can buy a painting and hang it on your wall in your home, but you're not gonna carry it around town with you. Um, being able to be the canvas for the art, I think plays a major role now more than it ever has. One of the more difficult things to do is try to put geometry on the body, to put something that's uh, very straight and angular on the surface, which is undulating. 
That's the big challenge. You don't have a tattoo before? No. No. I was Blanco. Blanco. <laughs> <laughs> and what decided you to get a tattoo? Uh, I wanted it for a long time, but I didn't know exactly what. And I started with a dragon because I'm born in 64, so it's the year of the dragon. And that's from there it started. Rene is an exception. I don't meet many people who are Blanco and start with the big tattoo because you have to really want it and be decided. And the fact that he waited a long time and didn't get a little tattoo is exceptional. Most people give in and get a little one and just to try it. Yeah. The impulse is huge. Rene, do you know a lot of people around you that are getting tattoo now? Yeah, almost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Right. He's walking around your arm. Okay. All right. We can keep the drums in too, if you like. Mm -hmm. I like the drums. When I breathe, my thorax moves, and that in turn moves my arm, and the lines become, uh, I sound like a diver. <laughs> when I first started tattooing, it almost became a joke where like, you know, we're all like trying to figure out how to like, the mystery behind tattoo machines and how they work, and, and there would always be some guy who's like, oh, Philip Blue does this, and you know what I mean? Like he screws this thing here and then puts his rubber bands like this, and everybody's like, no way, Philip Blue does it like that. And then of course we would all do it because we heard that Philip Blue did that. No, he's he's the man. While Japanese style tattooing expands in the West thanks to the talent of tattooists like Philip Lu, the uncontested master of the style, in Japan it's still something of an anathema. But its popularity with Westerners has made Japanese youngsters realize that Irizumi is considered an art form by the rest of the world. Tattooists like Shige, who runs Yellow Blaze Tattoo in Yokohama near Tokyo, has taken up the baton. I was so impressed by Philip Lu that I wanted him to tattoo his work over my whole body. Philip took Japanese-style tattooing to the West and propagated it. As a Japanese person, when I saw what he was doing, I found his style, how can I put it, ultra-modern. That's why Japanese youngsters are starting to consider traditional Japanese tattooing, irizumi, as an art form and not just a Yakuza thing. I think the recognition of tattooing has considerably increased. In Japan, embarrassing things must never be shown on the outside. I really love Shige's work. I think he's amazing. He's taken everything he liked from me and then went further. Very talented man. I want tattooing to be more fashionable here, like in the West. That's why I organized this event. The state and the municipality don't want to let us hire places for our conventions. They associate tattoo gatherings with gangs and the Yakuza.
Even this time, I received a call from the chief of police. If, unlike in Japan, tattooing appears widely understood and accepted in the West, some people continue to stretch its limits. They tattoo their hands, their faces, and by doing so, go back to that bad boy aura of the tattooing of old. so as not to forget that tattooing is a strong symbolic act, the artist Fuzi leaves the studio for a unique tattoo in a unique place. He makes it a genuine ceremony. All your life you'll remember being tattooed, whether it's the first time or the tenth, you remember the guy who did it. I want it to be unforgettable, so I emphasize the moment. How? Simply by doing it in an out-of-the-ordinary place. If I tattoo a guy in a subway tunnel because it's linked to my past as a graffiti artist, the act itself is meaningful. Looking around, finding a place, finding an electricity source. I found this to make a table. It's totally different, know what I mean? It's emphasizing the act itself. Et pour moi, to me, that's as important as the result. Well, yeah, there's a train coming. Yeah, very much so. There's lots of history down here, so it's very, it's very special. It conveys values they want to rediscover, which probably aren't fake. Maybe now, with the globalization of everything and the overload of information, visuals and aesthetics, they want to return to something sparser, that has meaning, that talks to them. Party. <laughs> I think there will always be a rebellious nature to tattooing. The fact that it hurts so much alone is a reason, you know? It scares some people. You can go buy a diamond ring in a jeweler store. You can pay a million dollars for it. You can put it on your finger and you can wear it out, the front door. You go buy a tattoo, now you have to sit down in a chair and take it. Now tattoos, there is, a discomfort to it. So you have to take them. Tattooing on a number of levels reminds you that you're alive. You know, the, the endurance of the pain, uh, the permanence of the commitment. Uh, these are all things we need more in society, in our lives in this society that, that um, draw us towards it. Everyone has their own reason for getting a tattoo. Some do it out of love, others out of hate. Some because they're extroverts, others because they're introverts, and some because they want to be poetic. I think that's why tattoos are so popular, you know, like, because, you know, like, everybody can put a, a reason why they're getting tattoos. I guess mine was a fuck you if I had to choose something in a way, and uh, um, this is me, you know. It's exciting, yeah, marking your skin. The one line or the magnum? Oh, the magnum. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a noise like this. 
<laughs> Mine sound more like wee. It's kind of like a money counter, you know, like. <laughs> I'd like to do that for you. Really, I would. Let me think. No, that's not gonna happen. That, that's classified. I'd, uh, you know, maybe next time. Is this just like? <laughs> People are very, very interested in tattooing today, and you never know when they're gonna get sick of it, you know, or they're going to make it illegal, you know, which would be kind of cool. You know, if they made it illegal, then we all go underground and 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 it'd be like it was in New York, you know, in the old older days, and um, we all have private private places and all that kind of stuff. Would would be would be kind of cool. <laughs>